what do you see here? Nice hotel room, right? Let me tell you what I see. I see a gap under the bed if you need to get a hoist in. I see a good bed height so an older person with a bad hip or knee can get in and out easily. A phone and a light switch beside the bed for convenience. I see curtains at a good height which are easy to open and close. And I see plenty of space around the bed, including movable furniture. I see a fully accessible room. I'm gonna to talk to you about three things. Who, why, and what. Who accessibility affects, why businesses should embrace good accessibility, and what we all can do to help improve things. But I'll start with a bit about my own background. Let me take you back to the 4th of August, 2002, and the day which changed my life. The weather was beautiful. The dubs had just run in the All-Ireland quarterfinal with Donegal, and life couldn't have been better. I got in from the match, and I got a phone call from a friend to see if I wanted to go camping that night with a group of them, I thought. The day that was in it, the weather, the way it was, why not? So we arrived to this field in North County, Dublin, a field that I would have known well growing up in the area, set the tents up and settled down. Now, I still don't know why to this day I did it. Maybe it was because I, I was an 18-year-old, and that's just what 18-year-olds do. But I decided to jump on top of a hay bale, which wasn't far from the tent. It was only about five foot high altogether. And as I was sitting there, all of a sudden I felt it begin to move. I looked back and saw that a friend was pushing it. So I tried to keep my balance, but a couple of seconds later I fell. Now next came this Indiana Jones type moment. The moon was trying to escape the big rolling boulder. Unfortunately, this wasn't a movie and I wasn't as lucky as Indy. As I lifted my head to quickly get out of the way, the rolling bale caught the back of my head, pushing it forward. I heard a crack and everything in my body went dead, like a bolt of lightning had struck. I heard some commotion and I asked one of the friends to lift my arm and I saw this limp, lifeless hand appear in front of my face. A hand that I should have recognized as my own, but didn't. And when he let go, my arm dropped to the ground with a thud. I knew something serious had happened. I'd broken my neck. In an instant, I'd gone from being six foot three to about three foot six and on wheels. And I struggled badly. I remember one of the, the first nights out after getting released from the hospital for a friend's birthday. The party was in town in a, a well-known place in the city center. And when I arrived, my heart dropped to see about 20 steps at a vertical angle down into this place. What was I to do? I, I couldn't be responsible for the whole night going pear-shaped. And the guilt would eat me up if anyone suggested that we go somewhere else because of me. So I said to the bouncers, look, I'm OK, if you're OK, to carry me down the stairs. And do you remember as a teenager getting turned away from a place for looking too young? I'm sure most of you still have that problem. <laughs> well, imagine getting turned away for being a fire hazard. And the sad part was, he was right. If something had happened when I was down there, I was a fire hazard. I'd never felt so small. 
And as I moved away from the door, this wave of emotion came over me. Is this what I'd been reduced to? A fire hazard. However, we don't grow when things are easy. We grow when we face challenges. And I like to dwell in the possible and the positive. I've always been that way. And because of that <coughs> mantra, I've lived a, a pretty incredible life since the injury. I was lucky enough to go to college to get my degree. I've started two businesses and co-founded our current award-winning company. I've been appointed to a government body by our Minister for Transport. I've advised the government. I've helped secure more than three million euro for accessible taxis. I've advocated on behalf of disabled people, designed and helped develop an IFTA-nominated TV show. I've built a house, I've traveled the world, even with these challenges. But life could be so much easier. And I'm gonna show you how. Which brings me to the first part. Who? Who does accessibility affect? Well, when I say the word accessible, what's the first thing you think of? Maybe the entrance into a building or a ramp, maybe? Let me try and dispel some of that. I'd actually, I'd argue that everyone in this room has a disability at some point. Think of a, a pregnant woman struggling to walk, an older person with a bad hip trying to navigate a number of steep steps, parent with a buggy trying to get through one of those strange rotational doors, you know, like something off gladiators. I know I'm showing my age there now. <laughs> A delivery man trying to get his trolley through a narrow doorway. Heck, even women in high heels who have to try and keep their balance and do that jelly legs thing, you know, as they walk across the cobblestones. <laughs> I'd demonstrate if I could, but I'm glad I can't. See, a disability can be temporary or permanent, but it's an issue which affects all of us at some point. There was a pedestrian bridge built in Venice not too long ago. And when it was first opened, it quickly became apparent that there was a serious problem. Can anyone see what's wrong with this picture? Little steps all the way across. Now forget about the wheelchair access thing for a second. This little detail impacted on so many different groups. Older people struggled, tourists with suitcases couldn't manage. And people with poor eyesight kept tripping and falling on the steps. The council were getting sued, the architects were getting sued, the builders were getting sued, everyone was suing everyone, it was a total mess. <laughs> All because accessibility wasn't considered from the start. Now after more than five years, they came up with this solution. There's a pod <laughs> on the side of the bridge it costs a couple of million, and it takes 20 minutes to get from one side <laughs> to the other. But the funny part is, a business actually developed locally because of this problem. Kids would wait on one side of the bridge, and they'd see maybe a tourist struggling with their suitcase. They'd offer them help, and then charge them a couple of euro to take it from one side to the other. Entrepreneurship at its finest, huh? <laughs> this new perspective has enabled me to see an opportunity. An opportunity for how we can make life so much more comfortable for everyone. It's a big idea, which starts with the little things. The layout of tables in a restaurant. An alarm clock which flashes and vibrates and makes that annoying noise. Menus in larger print. And a combination of all these little things create a much more comfortable environment for everyone. There's a, a famous Scandinavian hotel group who really buy into this. They use the example, they'd often get a lot of older people coming into their hotel who'd use a walking stick. Now, when they'd come up to the reception desk, they'd have to sign some papers to check in. They'd lean their stick against the bottom of the desk and most often it would fall over. So what did they do? 
They went down to the local IKEA. They spent four euro on a couple of hooks and put them below, below the reception desk. So now when someone comes in who uses a walking stick, they simply hook it in. And there's thousands of these little things. Imagine our whole society worked like that. So the next step beyond that is a principle known as, known as universal design. It's basically the design of products and environments usable by everyone to the greatest possible extent without the need for adaptions or specialized design. I'm not a designer, but I know what works. That hotel room I showed you at the start, that's an example of universal design. The Lewis flat platform, visual, signs, audio announcements, public transport incorporating universal design. This type of thinking needs to be ingrained in every element of government planning and decision making. And so, the, the why. Why should businesses embrace good accessibility? Well, simple, because it makes really good business sense. One in two people over the age of 65 have some form of a disability. We have an aging population. One billion people globally with a disability. By 2020, 25% of all tourism needs will come from those with higher access needs. Imagine the impact of that on our economy. That night, I couldn't get into the pub. Well, not only did they lose my business, but they lost out on 15 other people as well. One wheelchair user could determine where a wedding or a conference for more than 500 people takes place. So this makes really good business sense. And finally, the what. What can we all do to help create this accessible world? Well, in a word, lots. This is a global problem, and I'm here to recruit you. Not monetarily, because I don't think I'd be able to afford you, but <laughs> from a philosophical perspective. You see, a fully inclusive world is going to involve collaboration, legislation, determination, imagination, and realization. The realization to know that you, as an individual, can make a difference. So I'm going to ask you to do just two things. Very simple. If your local shop, pub, restaurant, or hotel has good accessibility, then please compliment them on this. Far too often we're quick to complain when things are bad. So the good needs to be recognized and celebrated. This will encourage more positive change. And on the flip side, if they could improve their accessibility, even a little bit, for the benefit of everyone, then make them aware. I know from experience, the effect that you can have on others is the most valuable currency there is. So don't be afraid to make suggestions. I started out on this journey after being stranded on a night out at the side of the road, not being able to get an accessible taxi. Now, not only did this impact on me, but I had two great friends who had to wait on with me at the side of the road in the freezing cold, pouring rain for six hours. I knew this wasn't good enough and came up with a plan to try and address this. This led to a change in regulations. We saw a 700% increase in the uptake of accessible taxi licenses in only six months after this. We've doubled the number of accessible taxis in the country in the last three years. And I'm only one individual. See, accessibility matters. It will impact on you at some point, and know that you, as an individual, can make a difference. This is life enhancing for everyone. We can have a world where those awkward conversations about what is and isn't a fire hazard are a thing of the past. Because an accessible world 
is an inclusive world. Let's move towards one and make life accessible for all. Thank you.